Good uh, afternoon, everyone, and you are very welcome to the latest uh, event that is being held uh, uh, by the Institute of International and uh, European Affairs uh, on uh, the rule of uh, law. My name is uh, Gavin Barrett. I'm a professor in um, uh, University College Dublin in the Law School, uh, and I'm very pleased uh, to uh, welcome uh, here today, uh, live uh, from Brussels, as it were, um, Commissioner Didier Renders, um, uh, who is, as we all know, the European uh, Commissioner for Justice, uh, and uh, he is going be speaking uh, to us today on a topic that could scarcely be uh, more topical uh, or important uh, and that is uh, the question uh, the topic of strengthening uh, the rule of law within the European Union uh, promotion prevention uh, and uh, and response uh, and uh, in his address to the IIEA today uh, Commissioner Vandeus will look at the variety of tools available to the European Commission to promote a rule of law culture to prevent rule of law problems from emerging or deteriorating and to respond uh, whenever a significant problem has been uh, identified uh, and he's going to be presenting these different tools which are part of the so-called rule of law toolbox and uh, give uh, an overview of the Commission's work uh, on the new comprehensive uh, European rule of law mechanism which will include an annual rule of law report we're told which will provide objective analysis of the situation in all member states so uh, uh, we're looking very uh, uh, much forward to that if I, I can just uh, say a short word about our uh, speaker as uh, speaker um, uh, Commissioner Renders was appointed Commissioner for Justice by Commission President uh, Ursula van der Leyen uh, with responsibility for upholding uh, the rule of law and judicial uh, cooperation uh, before this uh, he has um, an illustrious um, uh, curriculum vitae he was the uh, Deputy and uh, Prime Minister of Belgium Minister of Foreign and European Affairs Minister of Finance and Minister of Institutional um, uh, reforms so a huge amount of experience and I suspect you need every bit of it uh, to cope with this uh, with this particular uh, this particular challenge um, I understand uh, that uh, Commissioner Rendeos will speak uh, for approximately um, uh, 20 minutes and then we'll have some uh, time for questions uh, after that so uh, if you would like uh, to send in some questions uh, this afternoon uh, if you can use the questions uh, function uh, at the bottom of your zoom screen uh, to send those on uh, and then um, I'll, I'll put those questions uh, to the Commissioner uh, after that so without any further ado um, Commissioner, I'd like to you to, to I'd like to invite you um, to address this uh, this Zoom meeting. No, thank you, thank you for such an invitation, for your kind words uh, and of presentation. And ladies and gentlemen, of course, we have a long uh, expertise about the budgetary discussion and the structural reforms, but not so much about the rule of law. So I will be try to don't be too long in my uh, introductory remarks. But it's a pleasure, of course, to to join you uh, to discuss the Commission works on such an issue, the rule of law in the uh, European Union. Uh, the rule of law is a fundamental value of the European Union, as we can see in its constitutional text. It's indeed enshrined in Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union. We have seen maybe at the beginning of the Commission the discussions about the European way of life. And to my mind, the European way of life is the Article 2 of the Treaty. And that's very important to, to explain. And what makes the rule of law so important is that it guarantees the respect of all other values, uh, including democracy and fundamental rights. And the vast majority of European citizens recognize its uh, importance. In the uh, Eurobarometer survey carried out last year, citizens have been asked about their appreciation of the rule of law. And this survey covered a comprehensive series of 17 rule of law related, to, related uh, principles from uh, equality before the law or the prompt investigation of corruption cases to the independence of judges. Uh, that's a very important discussion now. And from all over the European Union, respondents perceived this principle as important or even as essential. At the same time, in the same Eurobarometer survey, the majority of responding citizens said they were not very well informed about the fundamental values of the EU. Indeed, when it comes to the understanding amongst citizens of what the rule of law actually means, there are sometimes significant gaps. Therefore, while we can see that citizens fundamentally support respect for the rule of law and expect public authorities to be committed to it, efforts should increase in terms of awareness rising. Recent developments in Europe have put the rule of law at the top of the EU's agenda, so it does not come as a surprise that it has been on the agenda of your institute as well, especially as regards Poland. These developments raise important questions uh, which the Commission has a duty to address. In order to do so, the Commission already has uh, what is often referred to as a rule of law toolbox. Such tools include, for instance, the country-specific recommendations in the European semester. It was, again, the situation in the last European semester 
recommendations uh, document we have uh, put inside and we will publish that um, some recommendations uh, in relation with the rule of law it's certainly with Hungary but not only about the independence of the judiciary in some different member states or the AU justice scoreboard we will publish the EU scoreboard in the next months we are in the next week sorry we have uh, organized the internal process in the commission now and we are ready to, to publish that uh, very soon where we compare national justice system in the EU as regards the independence of quality and efficiency because you know that it's very important to uh, be confronted with an independent judge but if it's possible so with a qualified one so we are working on the three elements independence quality and efficiency there is also the well-known possibility to launch infringement proceedings where eu law has been breached in recent years we have seen the open court of justice developing an important case law in this regard emphasizing the link between the rule of law and respect of eu law but it is clear that we need to do more and think outside of the traditional toolbox last year the commission therefore launched an important reflection process. We invited governments, NGOs, and other stakeholders from all over Europe to contribute. The result was a communication by the Commission, the former Commission, in July 19, focusing on three themes um, promotion, prevention, and response. First, on promotion, we need to address the knowledge deficit and build a common rule of law culture uh, in the EU. Second, we have to prevent rule of law problems from emerging or deteriorating. And third response, we need to reflect on the way to react more effectively to the significant problems once identified. From day one, President von der Leyen committed to carrying this work forward. Today, I will focus on what that means concretely. As regards promotion, uh, building a rule of law culture is about making EU citizens better aware of what the rule of law actually means for them. First, this requires to improve knowledge in the general public about the rule of law standards and the requirements set by EU law. The Commission is committed to support stakeholders and civil society in doing this. Second, we need to keep the public uh, debate alive on the rule of law. This is why discussions like the one we are having today are so important. I'm counting on think tanks like yours, as well as civil society more broadly, to keep this debate going. Third, the Commission is working with a series of partners, such as the Council of Europe, including the Venice Commission and the Greco, the Group of States Against Corruption, the OECD, or the uh, European Judicial Networks. The second major part of our work is about prevention. This is about detecting, detecting and remedying rule of law issues at an early stage. To do this, we need a better understanding of the situation of the rule of law in the whole European Union. This is what the new comprehensive European rule of law mechanism is all about. As Justice Commissioner, I have the honor to lead the Commission's work on this file. As part of this new mechanism, I'm coordinating the Commission's work on the first annual report on the rule of law, which will cover all EU member states with objective reports on an equal footing. That is one of the major initiatives of the new Commission. It includes monitoring significant developments, both positive and negative, in four areas. The justice systems, the anti-corruption framework, certain issues related to media pluralism, and all institutional issues related to checks and balances. Where relevant, the report will also reflect recent developments with regards to emergency measures adopted during the COVID-19 pandemic. We are currently making uh, good progress and are on track to publish the report in September as planned. So far, we have received written input from the EU member states and from over 200 stakeholders. My services are now conducting country visits, in fact, virtual country visits by video uh, with the member states. And uh, we are doing that in each, uh, the member state, each, each, each member state. On the 5th and the 6th of June, they conducted their virtual country visit to Ireland, our expert at a number of very informative meetings with the Irish authorities, the judiciary, and different stakeholders. And I would like to warmly thank the Irish authorities for these constructive exchanges. On the basis of all this input, we are, as I said, on track for the College of Commissioners to adopt the report in September. It will then serve as a basis for the incoming German presidency of the Council to, quick, to kick start a genuine political debate on the rule of law between the member states in the Council, the so-called peer review will start at the same moment.
this political debate also needs to take place in the European Parliament and in the Member States, notably in national parliaments, but also with civil society. I can assure you that I'm fully committed to that. The aim of, is to start a regular annual cycle and provide the impetus for the European Union to address problems in a cooperative way. This will notably help us to learn from one another experiences and best practices, but also to identify problems early on. Let us now turn to our third strand of work, the response. On top of establishing a better rule of law culture in the EU, and in addition to preventing problems for, from emerging, actual breaches to the rule of law must be dealt with. Let me start with infringement proceedings, where the independence of the justice system of a member state has come under threat. The Commission can bring infringement proceedings against this state. The principle of effective judicial protection and the right to an effective remedy are indeed guaranteed by Article 19 of the Treaty on the European Union and by Article 47 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. For instance, to protect judicial independence in Poland, the Commission has seized the Court of Justice a number of times, and each time with success. And it's very important to go to the Court with a robust, with a solid argumentation. But the EU has other possibilities to keep up the pressure to protect the rule of law. One way to do so is the procedure settled in Article 7 of the Treaty. This procedure can be triggered where there is a clear risk of a serious breach by a member state of the values referred to in Article 2 of the Treaty, values which include, of course, the rule of law. This procedure provides for the most serious political sanction the European Union can impose on a member state, the suspension of its voting rights in the Council. Until the 20th of December 17, Article 7 had never been triggered. Then the Commission launched such a procedure against Poland. Almost a year, one year later, it was triggered again, this time by the European Parliament, concerning Hungary. These are unprecedented steps in the history of the Union. I'm convinced that the Article 7 procedures should continue as long as the situation points to serious systemic threats to the rule of law in these member states. Even though this contributes to keeping political pressure on the member states concerned, Article 7 can only be one tool among others, notably because its voting procedures to adopt recommendations or sanctions in the Council are particularly demanding. A last reactive instrument of our toolbox is not yet operational. This is a new proposal for a mechanism to protect the EU budget in case of breaches of the rule of law in a member state. This legislative proposal of the Commission, made in 2018, is currently being examined by the European Parliament and the Council. Its rationale is simple. The objective is not to punish member states, but to protect the EU budget against corruption and fraud. For this, a member state needs, needs to have independent justice systems, effective investigation and prosecution services, and properly functioning public authorities allocating EU funds. Where this is not the case, where we see generalized deficiencies as regards the rule of law in a member state, we have proposed to give the Union the possibility to suspend, reduce, or restrict access to EU funding in a proportionate manner. However, individual beneficiaries of EU funds should not be affected. This is why the member state concerned would be obliged to honor payments to final recipients and beneficiaries. When proposing measures under this new mechanism, we would seek to target the types of funding that directly benefits from a member state's authorities. It's very important to focus on the authorities and not again on the beneficiaries and the recipients. If this proposal is adopted, it could make a very important contribution to uh, protecting the rule of law in the European Union. But I insist that I've said that about the Article 7, we have some difficulties to go to a recommendation due to the necessary majority, qualified majority or unanimity. So we need here to use the reverse qualified majority. It's very important. Uh, like we have organized in the budgetary discussions to use the, the so-called reverse qualified majority to simplify the way to decide something about the, this new uh, mechanism. So far, I've spoken about the rule of law without focusing on the current COVID-19 pandemic. i just make a reference there. 
But today, with the COVID-19 crisis, we are confronted with particular difficulties. As part of their response to the crisis, many member states have introduced emergency measures. Of course, I want to insist on the fact that the Commission stands in fully solidarity with the member states. As President von der Leyen said, we need to ensure that Europe does everything it can to save every life it can. But whatever the response, it must fully respect our fundamental principles and values as set out in the treaties, including the rule of law. So we are looking very carefully at how emergency measures are being applied in practice. So we are looking at the concrete impact of these measures. Situations which require close attention, attention are notably those where the powers granted to the executive are open-ended or where parliaments do not have the possibility to put an end to the state of emergency or to the measures adopted under the emergency regime. Second, we are also looking at the impact of emergency measures on fundamental rights, and notably whether such limitations go beyond what is proportionate. Third, we are also looking at the impact of emergency measures on EU law. Now we are entering a new phase of the crisis. This means that exceptional powers granted to governments should gradually be removed, or at least replaced by more targeted and less intrusive measures. That requires the Commission to remain extremely vigilant to ensure that emergency measures, especially those which affect fundamental rights and the rule of law, are adequately phased out. And as we are putting a lot of money on the table, you have seen that to help Europe to recover from the crisis, our proposal for a mechanism to protect the EU budget against generalized deficiencies on the rule of law is more needed than ever. We need it to apply not only to the next multiannual financial framework, but also to the new recovery fund that the Commission has proposed. It's quite the same that with the new uh, Public Prosecutor Office at the European level. We need more, maybe, the Public Prosecutor Office now than before, due to the fact that we will spend more money faster and maybe with more flexibility than in the past. So we need a lot of uh, control mechanism. And this one, the conditionality with the rule of law, is one of the possible uh, mechanisms to control the situation in the member state. As a politician, you have mentioned that in your introduction and in presentation, I have dealt with many crisis situations because as Belgian, minister, as Belgian finance minister with the global financial crisis of course, in 2007, eight and the years later, or as Minister of Finance and EU Affairs with the terrorist attacks linked to uh, Daesh, and today as Justice Commissioner with the COVID-19 crisis. Each time, there are lessons to be learned. What this crisis has taught is us is that we have to remain vigilant as regards the rule of law. Also, when we are focused on urgent issues, such as the protection of health or the economic recovery. I've said we support different actions taken by the member states, but we need to stay vigilant about the full respect for the rule of law in all the member states and maybe abroad. Um, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, I want to say that citizens need to be aware of what the rule of law means in practice. I've started with that. We need to build a real rule of law culture. And I'm hoping that after the publication of the first annual report on the rule of law in September, it will be possible, I said, not only to go to the Council, not only to go to the European Parliament, but also to the national parliament and to the civil societies in the different member states. Because if we want to have a real effect in the different member states, we need to organize a real national, local debate about the rule of law. It's the only one way to install a real culture of the rule of law in the whole European Union. And I hope that it will be possible with your support, maybe like with many other think tanks and NGOs and uh, members of the civil society. We have to be able to detect risks early, early on and uh, to prevent challenges from happening. As I said, this is notably the aim of the new rule of law mechanism. Of course, it's to install the culture of the rule of law, but also to detect the possible breaches to the rule of law in all the member states. And we must be ready to, to react to actual breaches. When it comes to protecting the rule of law, we must do it with our eyes, our ears, and our minds wide open. With this concluding remarks, let me thank you for your attention and saying that it's very important also in such a crisis time uh, to think that we have built a European Union based on values. And of course, it's very important to uh, organize now the, the, the recovery and the, uh, the resilience of our 
societies against possible crises, but one of the most important uh, resilience that we need to, to build or to come forth is the resilience about the, the different breaches to the rule of law, because it's very important to have all the different member states on board and to have all the citizens on board with a full respect for the, the same values. And I want to, to add a last sentence, if we want to say something abroad, about uh, the rule of law, human rights, democracy, and all that kind of values, we need to do the job at home. And it's maybe the, the first goal of the uh, new annual uh, report on the rule of law, but I insist on the fact that it's an additional tool in our toolbox. We'll continue to work with all the other tools, like the Article 7, the infringement proceedings, and many other kinds of uh, instruments that we have uh, at our disposal. But it's very important to try to have now the same kind of process about the values than we have since many years about the budgetary situation and the structural reforms in the uh, European Union. Thank you very much again for your, your attention. Thank you, partner. I muted myself oh, there uh, okay. while you were talking, so uh, I, I, I needed to be reminded to turn the microphone again. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you very much indeed for, for your, your very uh, fascinating account of what's happening right now um, in relation to the, the rule of law um, uh, at uh, European level. Now, we've already got uh, quite a, a number of questions in, but I'd encourage uh, um, uh, all of you attending, if you have any questions to ask uh, on the rule of law, um, to get them in, and we'll try to get uh, uh, through as many of them as we possibly can. Um, our first question is from John Bruton, who's the former um, uh, Taoiseach, or Prime Minister uh, of this country, and indeed the former uh, Deputy um, uh, Chair of the um, Constitution Convention that led to the um, uh, uh, the the um, uh, constitutional treaty and um, uh, what Mr. Bruton is uh, uh, asking is a question is that he, he mentions that the EU enlarged quite rapidly. He says without working out the details of what the rule of law should mean. Uh, what have we learned from that experience, and how differently will we approach uh, future enlargement? Uh, and uh, he wants to know if you would compare the rule of law in Northern Macedonia with that in Hungary. So that's that's the first one. No, it's it's true that it's a lesson learned from the uh, past experience that. Uh, we have till now some discussions, I've said that myself, uh, about the rule of law and uh, democracy and uh, fundamental rights in some member states. And you know that we have uh, uh, a sort of transition mechanism about some uh, new member states. We've said that we need to continue to organize a process with CVM about Bulgaria and uh, Romania. And so the lesson learned is that uh, we need to try uh, to solve such a kind of uh, issue before the accession. And so in the new uh, uh, decision of the Commission proposed to the Council and the Parliament about the uh, enlargement, we have said that we will start the negotiation with the rule of law and will conclude the negotiation with the rule of law. In my mind, that means that we need to be sure that before to become to be a full member state, there is a full respect for the rule of law in the candidate countries. Uh, without that, we will uh, import again in the European Union some problems. Uh, if I may, I will uh, make a comparison maybe. Uh, we are saying also to the Western Balkans that we need to solve all the border issues because if you import a border issue in the European Union, it's very difficult to solve. I don't want to point out one problem, but you know that we have for the moment since some years one uh, unsolved issue between two members in the same region. And uh, again, we need to be very strict on this. I fully understand that it was the first uh, occasion in the past where we have had a lot of enlargement, but we have a huge enlargement uh, 15, more than 15 years ago. And then we have continued to uh, give uh, uh, some possibility to accede to, to, ac to have an access to the European Union. But again, in the new procedure, we have said uh, we need to start with the rule of law and to conclude with the rule of law. And the goal is to be sure that it's possible to fulfill all the criteria and certainly to have full respect for the rule of law before to come in. Of course, after that, uh, we need to continue to monitor the situation because it's not because you have a full respect for the rule of law before the accession that you will continue later, like for the budgetary situation. It's possible to say that uh, one candidate is in order with uh, the Maastricht criteria, and then uh, 10 years later or 20 years later, you see that there are some problems. But uh, it's true that it's a lesson learned from the last uh, decennia to say that we need to be maybe uh, more concerned about the full respect for the rule of law before the accession, the day before. Okay, thank you very much for um, 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 that response, Commissioner. Um, the next question comes from uh, Professor John O'Hagan, who's Emeritus Professor of Economics at Trinity College Dublin. Uh, and he's asking uh, the question of whether there is a danger that the rule of law in the European Union could be undermined if certain laws are not effectively enforced and in a timely manner. Um, um, uh, and I, I think what he's getting at here 
um, although um, it doesn't elaborate very much on this question, is perhaps um, that uh, the Commission is a little bit slow, perhaps, in prosecuting breaches um, in the area of the, 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 the rule of law. Um, uh, so that might be, um, uh, uh, there might be an implicit criticism, if you like, in, in, in the question there, and the question as to whether that, uh, for example, is not assisting um, in, the, in the process of uh, dealing no, with uh, maybe, uh, uh, <laughs> the answer to such a question, maybe three remarks. The first one, it's very important, it's true, to enforce the EU law, because sometimes we have huge discussions about some new proposals, but without real attention to uh, the real enforcement of the actual legislation. And to give an example, we will have in the next days a discussion at the, at the Commission level about the GDPR. GDPR is a beautiful regulation. Uh, after two years, it was the second anniversary, uh, we have a good evaluation of the GDPR, but what is the main issue? It's to be sure that the GDPR is well in enforced in all the member states in the same way. And that's an example, but we have a lot of legislation where it's very important to show that we are working on the enforcement. Of course, it's very important to think about new evolutions for the near future, but if you don't uh, have a correct application of the actual legislation, it's not a, a, a solution. And we have had during the crisis huge discussions on this. Uh, to give an example about tourism, uh, we have a legislation given some rights to the consumers. Is it possible to protect the consumer rights also in the crisis time? And to say to the airlines companies or to the two operators, it's possible for the consumers to be reimbursed if there is a flight or travel to cancel. It. And of course, we have received the question, yes, but uh, we have many problems with liquidities in uh, the airlines companies. No, but we have said to the member state, you need to apply the AU law. And if it's not the case, my second remark, of course, we don't have to hesitate. We need to go to the court if it's needed, if we don't have a, a correct application. And also about the rule of law, I don't want to stay in the consumer uh, area. On the rule of law, uh, we have started with the new commission in December. Uh, in the beginning of the year, in February, I have asked the commission to go back to the court to ask, to, for, to, to ask the interim measures about the disciplinary procedures in Poland against judges. And we have received a positive answer from the court in April. And then we have decided to launch a new infringement proceeding about the so-called Muzzle Law, the last law in Poland about the uh, uh, judicial organization. And it's very important to do that. But I said with a robust argumentation. So it's true that sometimes it takes some weeks or one or two months before to introduce the case. But it's very important to my mind uh, to have a real robust argumentation. Because if we are going to the court, of course, you are not sure that you will receive a positive answer from the court, but think about the fact that one day you will have a negative answer about the rule of law and uh, it will be used in one of the other member states. You say uh, uh, we are in order, we are fully compliance, in full compliance with the rule of law and uh, the commission is organizing maybe a political action. So we need to be very robust, but we don't hesitate. But the third issue, and that's maybe the problem, uh, there's a difference now between the public debate and the legal uh, debates uh, in time. Uh, of course, we don't have before the court the same timing than on Twitter. And that's a real issue because every day I receive uh, demons to go to the court to do something to react. First, we need to be competent. Is, this, is it possible for the Commission to do something? Is it a real AU competence? Uh, you have seen at the beginning of the crisis, we have received many requests about pearls. Is it possible to do more? But it's a national component, and we have tried to organize a coordination. About the rule of law, the same. Uh, in the last days and weeks, uh, just to give an example, uh, I don't want to mention from one uh, part of the EU, but you have a declaration of one politician, and you receive a request to react. Yes, it's possible to give a political reaction, but not to go to the court because one member of the government of one member of the parliament have said something in one member state so there's also there a difference uh, I, i'm sure that we have uh, uh, act very fast about the interim measures uh, for the disciplinary procedure in Poland, but it was needed to do that in february and the court was very fast but it was beginning of april that it was possible for the court to uh, uh, send a very clear message to suspend all the procedure now I've sent a new letter to the Minister of Justice in Poland to have some clarifications. And of course, during such a period of time, there are many public debates about that. But you know that there's a difference between the, the political debate in the parliament, the, the debates in the press, or like I said, in the social media, on Twitter, or, or on other kind of social media, and our capacity to receive a positive reaction from the court. 
uh, it's the only, at the end is the more efficient way is the infringement proceedings if we don't have the capacity to have an open dialogue with one member state but that takes some time it's true mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much indeed uh, for that. Um, we have a question in from Connor Ryan from the Department of Foreign Affairs as well, and it's in relation to um, Article 7, uh, which of course um, uh, has the um, uh, provision both for persistent seri serious and persistent breaches, uh, and um, uh, um, uh, also um, a provision, uh, of course, uh, uh, in, in Article 7.1 uh, for the, the clear risk. But both of these um, uh, procedures um, have problems uh, with them. And uh, um, uh, the question uh, that uh, is being, being asked here, I suppose, is, um, you know, what role can they play, uh, if any, um, in the, um, the solution of rule of law problems um, at a uh, European level? Yes, but uh, Article 7 is a very... Uh uh, impressive procedure, in fact. I said it's quite new to organize uh, uh, such a kind of process since 2017, because before it was not used. And uh, it's difficult to manage due to the, uh, the procedure. Uh, we need to have qualified majority or unanimity mm. in the different cases. And that's the, the real issue. Of course, it's possible to go back to the Council and the, and, the, and the Parliament to ask something else, but it's a new treaty, so it's treaty change is not easy. It's the reason why, in the conditionality about the funding, we try to have another kind of mechanism and we try to uh, organize the process with a reverse qualified majority, like for the budgetary discussion. Because uh, if we don't have the reverse qualified majority, it will be possible for some member states to organize mm -hmm. a package at the council level. And it's a reason why, for the moment, it's very important to continue the procedures against Poland and Hungary to push a political pressure to have a political debate at the council level. But it's very difficult to, to conclude. And that's a, a real uh, a problem that we have, because to conclude, you need to ask a vote. And again, if you have a, a vote with a blockage, with uh, an impossibility to go to the qualified or the uh, majority onto the un unanimity in the different phase of the posture, it's like a, a positive decision for the member states. You don't have the capacity to conclude about uh, a real sanction. And uh, it's the reason why I said that the new mechanism and the conditionality are just additional tools. Uh, maybe one day it will be possible to change the procedure about Article 7, but we are not so far. But uh, we need to have additional tools to repair, in fact, such a kind of problem that it was uh, mentioned in the question. Uh, but it's due, first of all, to the procedure. But it's very efficient. It's a real political pressure. It's a real open debate. But the most efficient way for the moment is still the infringement proceedings. And maybe if we receive a positive reaction from the Council, the conditionality about the budget. And that will be, you know, that a, a financial pressure on the member states is very efficient. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that's, that's a very useful response uh, indeed, if I may say so. Great. Uh, we have a question uh, from a countryman of yours, uh, and that is uh, Pierre-Emmanuel de Bau, who is the, uh, I'm sure you know, the, the ambassador of Belgium to, uh, to Ireland. Uh, and uh, uh, his question is, um, uh, he says, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, talking about prevention, uh, you mentioned an annual review cycle, but how will the different sorts of review by the Commission, by the European Parliament, or even peer review among council members interact? Who will be in charge of giving a global uh, picture uh, in this regard? Well, it's possible, thank you for the question, because I know <laughs> very well the uh, representative in, in, in Dublin. But uh, mm -hmm. of course, it's possible to think about a perfect situation in some years, maybe on medium and long term. Uh, in my vision, it will be possible to organize an open debate on all, if I may. Not only the rule of law report, but maybe also a report on the Charter of Human Rights maybe the democracy action plan and sort of discuss on democracy, fundamental rights, and the rule of law. But in such a way, uh, there is a request from the parliament to have a more comprehensive, a more global approach. Uh, we will do that, but we will start uh, with a very pragmatic way, with the report on the rule of law. Next year, we'll have a report on the charter. And of course, we will come and saw this year with a democracy action plan. And uh, I'm sure that my intention is to conclude for September with uh, the presentation of the report on the rule of law. And then it's an annual report, so it will be a long-going process. Uh, we will receive maybe many criticism about the report. It will be possible to have another scope. For the moment, I've said we have four issues in the uh, annual report to start to do something, and the dependence of judiciary is very important, of course. Then it will be maybe possible to extend and to organize an integration. But in the first phase, uh, it's very important to have a debate in the Council 
and in the parliament, so the peer review in the council and an open debate in the parliament about our report, and also a debate at the national level. Uh, because I said it's very important to install a real culture on the rule of law in the member states and to, to go to the member states. Some member states will be easy to organize, in others it will be maybe more complicated, but we'll try in both cases with the parliament or with the civil society. And uh, if you look to the situation now, I'm sure that for the German presidency, it will be possible to organize a, a general debate on the first report that we will publish in September. Then maybe to start, we are in discussion about, uh, discussion about that, to start a real peer review. So to analyze the situation of all the member states, maybe in two years' time, uh, like we have for the moment the uh, uni universal periodic review at the UN level. You know that that takes more time because there are many members, of course. But uh, you need to go to Geneva and to answer to many questions about the situation on the human rights in your own uh, country. And at the open level, it must be possible to do that at council level. So on the basis of our report, to engage a real discussion and a peer review on all the different member states. In two years time, it will be possible to take the 27. And in the parliament, to have a real open debate, like at the uh, uh, national level. But of course, I'm not against after some years to try to have an integration of all those uh, mechanisms and to have not only the rule of law report, but the, I said the report on the charter, and maybe the democracy, democracy action plan, and at least at the parliament level to organize one debate on the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights. But you need to start. And I'm all the time very uh, impressed by uh, the ambition of, of, very man, of many participants to say we need to do more. But in some years, it was impossible to do something. And so now we have the communication, I said, from the commission. It's possible to start with the report. And on such a basis, it will be possible to build year after year a more robust uh, mechanism and maybe with more issues on the table. But to start with independence of judiciary, fight against corruption, media pluralism, and checks and balances, I'm sure that it's a good start. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Right, and to move then from a question from a current serving ambassador to a former uh, ambassador, <laughs> this a former Irish ambassador, um, uh, Peter Gunning, who is a member of our um, EU27 group uh, here. Um, in the uh, Institute of International and European Affairs. Uh, and uh, what uh, Peter uh, um, uh, says is, thank you for a very clear description of the new annual rule of law report. Um, um, uh, so a nice diplomatic beginning there, but he comes with a sting in the tail afterwards then. And his question is, um, uh, um, uh, it, it could possibly be a very heavy and dense document. Um, is there not a risk in this of diluting the debate uh, and the, the focus on the most uh, glaring instances of deviation from EU values and the rule of law? So in other words, the danger, if you like, that this document, if you like, forms a kind of um, noise, if you like, that drowns out attention from, from, from the most uh, serious problems um, um, uh, in the likes of Hungary and Poland concerning the rule of law. But again, I said it's an additional tool, but we'd far so to have another one. Uh, the conditionality in the funding of uh, uh, the different uh, uh, policies and so on, the funding of the different member states, in fact, uh, where is the different policies. And if there's a more general uh, breach to the rule of law, it's a more generalized deficiency of the rule of law in one member state, it must be possible to suspend or to stop some funding. But to be very concrete, in the annual report, normally, <laughs> we will have some remarks in quite all the member states, because of course you have some problems with the rule of law in all the member states. But sometimes, I don't want to say it's uh, details, but it's very specific issues, and it's possible to engage a dialogue to change that and to organize a remedy to that. It's quite different if you have a so-called, I was miss of finance, a so-called systemic risk, and a more systematic breach to the rule of law. Mm -hmm. And if you look to the discussion that we have for the moment with Poland about the independence of the judiciary, we are more in a real debate about uh, a very generalized deficiency in such a fight, such a field of uh, um, independence of the judiciary. And there, of course, you need to have other tools. Other tools, that means infringement proceedings, again, that we have used since some years with success before the court, and maybe. Uh, to, if it's impossible to take a decision in the Article 7 procedure due to the, uh, the, the, the voting uh, procedures, we need to have a new conditionality for the, uh, the funding of the, the different policies. But we are moving step by step, if I may. And uh, again, I'm very impressed by uh, many comments to say you need to do more. But it's the first time that we have a real instrument in all hands, except 
the infringement proceedings. And uh, I want to say that in the report, we will try to exchange the best practices to show very positive evolution because we have also very positive evolutions in some member states about different issues. But if we have a real problem in one concrete situation, we will engage in dialogue or we'll go to the court. If it's more generalized, we need to receive the support from the Council and the Parliament to have another tool and maybe the conditionality about the financing that will be the, the, the most efficient pressure. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, we have one uh, very brief uh, question from another uh, former Irish uh, ambassador. I, I detect a slight note of scepticism in it, but I'll, I'll leave you to judge that. It's um, um, Bobby McDonough, who is, you know, was the former Irish ambassador to the, the United Kingdom. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, his question is a very simple one. On a scale of one to ten, how nervous is Orban likely to be about the Commission's rule of law toolbox? Box? <laughs> Maybe not so, so much, I'm sure around five, something like that. that would be very... <laughs> no, no, because we have seen in the, in the past that uh, with a... To, I, want, I want to give an example. Since the beginning of this crisis, mm -hmm. we have said at the Commission level that it's impossible to stay with the state of danger in Hungary, a state of emergency, for a very long period of time without any end or without any capacity for the Parliament to take a decision. And we have seen that uh, in the last days, it was possible in Hungary to say we'll go to the parliament to, to put an end to this situation. So if you have a real dialogue and if you emphasize the real risk that you have seen in the beginning of the crisis uh, with the new law about the state of danger, it's possible to receive a positive result. So I'm sure that also in Hungary there are some possibilities to, to organize some changes in the way to manage the situation. Uh, but it's not easy, of course, it's, a, it's an open dialogue. So. Um, I'm sure that it's around five. <laughs> it's in between because we have seen that some pressures are efficient, mm -hmm. of course, but um, if it's needed, we need, we will also introduce some uh, new uh, infringement proceedings. We are analyzing for the moment not only the law of the state of danger, but we are analyzing all the measures taken in application of the law and in the labor code, in the way to take over some uh, uh, companies in. Uh, in Hungary or to send some uh, militaries, military people to, to different enterprises. There are some problems with the rule of law and we will decide if it's needed to go to the court. So it's uh, quite a balanced situation that we have since the beginning of the decision with Hungary. Great, thank you very much indeed. That's a, a, a very clear answer there. Um, now, I hope uh, the attendants won't think I'm biased in favor of former ambassadors, but I have another question from a former ambassador, this time from Marie Cross, um, who is actually the chair of our EU27 group uh, and uh, uh, she's asking a specific question about the, the latest draft um, um, of the MMF by the Commission um, um, uh, there's a proposal uh, for a regulation on the protection of the EU budget against generalized deficiencies in the rule of law uh, and she is asking if you could elaborate uh, on what measures are envisaged in this particular regulation. Well, to protect the EU budget we have different elements. I want maybe to insist I've just mentioned that uh, on one point is the Open uh, Public uh, Prosecutor Office, the PPO. It's a new uh, tool. We have, the, had, we have had the designation of the Chief Prosecutor, Mrs. Covesi, uh, by the Council and the Parliament. And uh, now I'm in charge to install the new uh, Prosecutor Office at EU level. For the first time, yeah, we'll have a Prosecutor Office to uh, organize investigations and prosecutions against uh, fraud and abuses in relation with the budget. And I need to install at the end of the year to be able next year to, to start. And I'm saying, that, I'm saying that because it's very important. I said uh, during my, my remarks, we will spend, if we have the agreement of the Council and the Department, but normally we'll spend more money with the, the MFF and the Recovery and Resilience Facility, uh, the next generation AU, we'll spend more money faster and with more flexibility. And everybody knows. If you are doing that, there are more risks. So we need first to organize for the first time a real prosecutor office at the EU level. That's uh, to control and maybe to, to sanction some fraud. But we are sure also that if we want to have a correct uh, use of the EU funding and of the uh, new MFF and the recovery uh, plan, we need to be sure that it's possible to have a real independent justice system in all the member states to have some possibilities at the national level to organize some investigations and prosecutions. And that is the rule of law. It's the first uh, issue that we will uh, take uh, in our report, on board in our report, the independence of the judiciary and the functioning quality of, of 
source and so on, and efficiency of the judiciary. If you don't have that, but you need maybe to stop the funding. And we have two, uh, well, three elements. The first one, I insist on it, uh, is the procedure. If we want to be efficient, we need to have a reverse qualified majority and not to have the same risk of blockage than in the Article 7. The second element is that we need to have a, a proportional reaction. So it must be possible to suspend or to stop a part of, more than that, uh, of the funding. So it's not just black or white, it must be possible to, or to suspend for a certain period of time, or to block, or to, to stop the funding uh, in a proportional manner. If you have some breaches to the rule of law, due to the level of the breaches and the importance of the breach, you need to take a decision. And uh, the third element that I've mentioned is to protect the fact that we need to protect the final beneficiaries. Because it's, first of all, it's not a sanction to the member states. It seems to be, of course, because there's a breach of the rule of law. But it's first a protection of the EU budget. And it's certainly not a sanction against the beneficiaries. To give an example, in the agricultural policy, we don't want to sanction the farmers. We want to sanction the fact that there's a real breach to the rule of law in one member state. So we need to ask to the, the so-called, the concerned member state to continue to pay the final beneficiaries if it's not the case, we need to find a way to organize maybe a direct, it's not easy, we are thinking about that, a direct financing. Because again, uh, it's a, a mechanism to protect the EU budget and not to sanction, certainly not the member state, but more than that, because there is a breach of the rule of law, certainly not the, the final beneficiaries. And there we need to find a way to have a direct financing or to, to have an obligation for the member state to finance uh, the final beneficiary. But it's a legislative proposal. It's on the table of the Council and the Parliament. And of course, of course, or, or it will be taken on board in the MFF discussions, and it will be the result of the MFF discussion. I want to explain that in all the documents that we have approved on the 27th of May at the college level, we have put such a conditionality. Also in the new documents about the recovery and resilience facility and other kind of new instruments, rescue AU and others, in all the different new instruments, we have put the same conditionality. And so if it's possible to receive uh, a positive reaction from the Council, we'll use that. I want just to say that it is the first time that we will have a, a real debate on it at the Council level, and uh, normally we need unanimity. So, of course, it will be uh, a tough discussion, mm. but I'm, I'm not saying that I'm confident, but I'm more confident than before the crisis, because, again, we'll spend more money, faster, with more flexibility, so there are more requests in some member states, at least, to have a full respect for the rule of law. It's very difficult to ask to the taxpayers in one member state mm -hmm. to be in full solidarity with another member state where there are so many breaches to the rule of law. So there is maybe a, a more important support for that, but we will see. And if it's not uh, uh, on board in the, the final conclusions of the Council, maybe on the MFF, we'll continue to defend such a proposal. It's a legislative proposal, so it's possible for the Commission to continue to work on it with the Parliament and the Council. Wonderful. Thank you very much for this very comprehensive reply um, to, to that um, question. Now, if I may, I'm going to roll two questions into one here because we've had a, a question from Deirdre Michalachon, who's from the Irish Council uh, for Civil uh, Liberties, and Mark McNulty, uh, uh, both of whom uh, want to ask uh, about the inclusion of civil society, that how will that work um, 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 in, in, in the, the area of justice uh, in particular, and how uh, will you ensure that you bring in voices from NGOs and other stakeholders, uh, which are often um, not heard at, uh, at national and at EU level? If I may, we have, I've said we will publish the scoreboard, the justice scoreboard in July, maybe uh, just before, just after the next uh, uh, Justice Council at the EU level. Uh, and that's a quantitative analysis. Then the rule of law report is more a qualitative one. And so we receive, of course, some uh, informations, facts and figures for the scoreboard from many stakeholders. But for the rule of law report, it's something else. We have decided since the beginning to work, of course, not only with the member states, but with all the possible members of the civil society and with all the different classical partners about the fundamental rights and rule of law and human rights and democracy. And so it's the reason why it was maybe very short, but I've said uh, we have started a process with the member states. So I've uh, asked the member states to appoint a contact person, and we have had many meetings to prepare the discussions with the different contact persons from the different member states. We have asked the member states to send to us some remarks and comments about sort of questionnaire that we have sent on the basis of the different chapters that we want to analyze. And so I received many questions to say, yes, but if you are working just with the member states, uh, it's a problem because you will receive, of course, positive figures from the member states. No, but since the beginning, we've said no. 
the consultation is not only with the member states, it's possible for everybody, for all the NGOs or think tanks or organizations to take part. And so the reason why I've said we have received, of course, remarks from the member states, but also remarks from more than 200 stakeholders all over Europe. Classical one, like the Council of Europe, of course, or FRA, the Fundamental Rights Agency, but also for many, many uh, national organizations. And we'll continue. And I said we have organized just now uh, a so-called virtual uh, country visit to Ireland. And we have had contacts with the Irish authorities, of course, but also with other stakeholders in the civil society. And we'll continue to work with the civil society. And uh, the, the next step will be when we will publish, because it will be a report from the commission, not from the member states. It will be a report uh, approved by the commission in September, and then we will go to the council and the parliament. After that, I said, uh, I want to go to the national parliament, and maybe, if we have some difficulties, we'll organize different debates with the civil society. And uh, it's possible also in Ireland to do both, to go to the parliament with the report and to organize that with civil society. And so year after year, we'll receive more and more remarks, not only about facts and figures, to be sure that we have correct vision of the uh, situation on the ground, maybe to make some proposals to, our, to have a better situation in one of another member state, and then to install the so-called culture of the rule of law. And that's very important. If I may, I will give an example. Uh, due to the murder of a journalist, you have seen that we have had uh, uh, very difficult discussions in Malta, mm. and, and uh, with some political consequence, a change in the government at the end of the year, at the beginning of this year, and we have discussed about the way to organize some uh, reforms of the uh, justice system in, in Malta. And I've had many discussions with the former justice of, the Minister of Justice in December and the new one since the beginning of this year. And I've seen, I'm not saying that it will be perfect, I don't want to say that, but I've seen that it was possible for the new government to propose some new reforms, to ask to the Venice Commission to give an advice, then to go back to the commission to see if there are uh, some uh, positive answers to the various commission. And so we are in a process due to what? Of course, maybe uh, due to the pressure of some uh, international institutions and so on, but due to a real internal debate in Malta with more and more uh, actors in the civil society asking for some changes due to such a difficult situation after the murder of a journalist. So I'm sure that if we want to have real changes in some parts of Europe, we need to install a real culture on the rule of law. And uh, like we have tried to install a culture about the budget and the structural reforms since some decades. And that will be not the only one way. It's very important to push pressure coming from the Open Commission, from the Parliament, from many other organizations. But at the end, the best way is to receive the support of the citizens and the civil society inside the member state. And the example of Malta is very clear. It was possible to discuss in some months about huge judicial reforms due to the pressure coming, of, so, of course, from outside, but certainly from inside the uh, Maltese society. Maltese society, that's very interesting. Yes. That's great. Well, uh, thank you very much indeed. Now, we, I think we might have time just to pop in. We're coming close to the end at this stage now. Um, uh, so thank you very much for your, your patience and, and your uh, willingness to answer so many questions. Um, uh, maybe if I can pop in just um, two very rapid final questions. One of them uh, is, um, uh, has the decision of the Bundesverfassungsgericht um, uh, recently, has that made life um, um, uh, more difficult uh, in terms of um, uh, expecting compliance um, in relation to uh, uh, decisions of the European Court of Justice in the rule of law area. Uh, and uh, also we have a, a question in from uh, Pepin uh, Gerrit uh, of the uh, Dutch Helsinki Committee uh, who's asking um, uh, if uh, perhaps um, um, uh, tools regarding the internal market, if you like, some kind of um, um, uh, sanctions regarding internal market rights might be a way also of enforcing compliance with the, with the rule of law. So, and I'm sorry, they're, they're, that's a rather packed, two, two rather packed questions, but uh, there you go. You have all of three minutes to deal with them. <laughs> no, but first, about Karlsruhe, to be concrete. Yeah. Uh, first said from the beginning, uh, uh, the President of Ireland have said that we saw just after the decision, uh, the ruling, we need to protect some principles at the EU level. Of course, mm -hmm. the monetary policy, the exclusive competence of the EU, and so there's no doubts about the role of the ECB, and the exclusive competence of the uh, European Union about the monetary policy through the ECB. The second element is the privacy of the EU law, of course. Mm -hmm. The third one is the exclusive competence of the uh, 
a court of justice to give an interpretation of the EU. But that's the first element. But I've said that for other issues, uh, we need to have a robust analyze and solid arguments before to do something or not. And the president of the commission, I've asked to the legal service, I've asked also to my DG, the DG justice, DG just, uh, to make such an analyze. And so uh, we have uh, the intention to receive a very concrete uh, analyze with solid arguments to say if it's possible to do something. And the president will decide in the near future to go back to the college to take a decision. But we want to have uh, 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 the same treatment from one of another member state. It's very important to be very clear on this. We want to see what are the facts, what are the uh, possible effects of such a decision on the EU law. Do I re repeat the principles? We are analyzing now with the services uh, the detail of the, because it's a very complicated decision. It seems to be very simple but it's a complicated one, so we need to have a precise analyze of it. And then the president of the commission will decide to go back to the, the college to take a decision to move uh, or not about, about that. About the internal market, uh, it's very important to explain maybe uh, very briefly the link between the independence of judiciary, to give an example, in the situation that we have discussed in Poland or in Hungary sometimes, and the internal market. Because there are, of course, some consequences in the justice field. That is very clear. Example, example the European S warrant. We have seen some member states refusal by a judge to surrender some uh, uh, man and woman to one other member state due to a possible breach of the rule of law. So there's an influence, of course, in the justice system. But it's also an influence on the internal market because if you uh, don't have an independent justice, justice system, there's an hesitation, at least, for many investors to come in like we have in the trade agreements, if you are not sure that it's possible to go to an independent and qualified judges, judge, if you have a problem uh, with your investment in another member state, of course, we have a real institution and we have had some remarks from different companies in the last uh, weeks and months about that. Um, to be concrete in the discussions in Poland, there are some uh, uh, remarks for the moment about the fact that if it's possible to have some difficulties with uh, the independence of the judiciary, there are some hesitations to invest and to continue to take part. And in general, of course, the primacy of the EU law and um, the exclusive competence of the uh, European Court of Justice are also two key elements of the internal market. Because if you are not able to protect those principles, mm -hmm. you don't have an EU law. Mm -hmm. And you become to have a conflict between a national law and the European one. And that is impossible. There is a real primacy. And without the primacy, of course, we have a real... Uh, uh, blockage in the internal market. It's not just, if I may, about the rule of law in one country. It's a real problem for the functioning of the internal market. And it's become to be more and more clear. But again, thanks for maybe such a discussion today. But uh, you ask what is possible to do with the civil society. Uh, it's maybe one of the issues. How it's possible to explain more to the citizens, to the companies, how important it is to have a full respect for the rule of law. Because it seems to be very theoretical. Uh, independence of the justice system, yes and then. But if you explain that in some concrete cases, you need to go to justice. And if you don't have in front of you an independent and qualified judge, you have a real problem. And if you see that there is a link between the judge and the, the executive body in the country, in the member state, of course we have more and more problems because you are not on an equal footing in the discussions in justice. And that is uh, more and more and more important to explain to the citizens what are the risks with a non-independent justice system. And we need also to explain that more and more to the companies. But I said, we have received uh, questions from different companies saying that uh, there are many hesitations to continue to, to invest if you don't uh, be sure that it's possible to have an independent response from the justice uh, system. Mm. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we ended there with some very um, big questions there and very very big issues and uh, stressing the importance of, uh, of this sort of debate and the practicality of it. I think that's entirely appropriate. Um, uh, so I'd like to thank you for, for your um, uh, enormous willingness to engage uh, uh, here today uh, uh, with us. It's been very, very much appreciated. We have had other events and will have other events relating to the rule of law, but I can honestly say um, that I can't recall one from which I've learned so much uh, personally myself. So it's been, it has been really wonderful and I would like to thank you um, uh, for, for, your, uh, for, for your assistance and for your willingness to be here with Thank us. you again for your invitation and when we will have the report, I'm hoping in September, because I said we are on track uh, to go to the college in September, it will be a pleasure uh, to explain that not only in the Council or in the European Parliament, but maybe at the national level 
And if it's possible to work with some actors in the civil society to do that, it would be a pleasure to come back. Well, there are many people in the room who will be very, very interested, I think, in that invitation. And I'm sure we'd be delighted to see you back in the Institute uh, at, at any stage. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you also to all of you who have participated uh, with us here today. Uh, please keep an eye um, on the um, uh, Institute's website um, for further events uh, relating to justice and home affairs. But from us, it's, uh, it's, it's good afternoon. And, uh, and thank you once again. Bye -bye.